It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope. From the CBS television news staff, Larry Lasseur and Charles Collingwood. Our distinguished guest for this evening is the Right Honorable Selwyn Lloyd, British Minister of State. Mr. Lloyd, as British Minister of State and leader of your country's delegation to the United Nations, you're right in the cockpit of international affairs. Now, last spring, it seems to me, there was a lessening of international tensions, and this year, this fall, there seems to be a stiffening of them. What shape do you think the world is in right now? Well, I wouldn't be as positive as you are about the present state of affairs. I think it's quite true that compared with 1951 and 1952, there was a definite relaxation in tension in February of this year, following upon the death of Stalin. That went on in uh, April and May, and I would say the present state of affairs is that we're marking time. It isn't quite certain which way it's going to go. And that's why I think it's very important that in each step we take, we're very careful indeed not to make things worse. Well, in the light of that uh, idea that we're now marking time, what do you think the free world should do in the present situation? Well, the first thing, I'm, I'm quite, quite certain what we should not do is to relax our efforts to build up our own defenses. I'm perfectly certain that, that one of the things which is making for peace is the fact that the free world has been building up its own defenses. Uh, I'm certain we must not relax in any way. At the same time, I think we've got to show ourselves ready to negotiate on any problem, at any time, at any level. We, we've got to be willing to try and negotiate, and that isn't the same thing as appeasement. Negotiation is not appeasement. We've got to try and settle some of the outstanding issues if we can. At the same time, we've got to be very certain not to be put in the position of negotiating from weakness. I don't think the Soviet uh, bloc understand negotiating from weakness. We've got to be strong, uh, but at the same time, we've not got to lose any opportunity uh, of negotiating if we can. Well, Mr. Minister, one of the places where both sides are certainly marking time and where uh, not much negotiation is being done is in Panmunjom. Do you think that the chances of a Korean peace conference are hopeless now? No, I don't think they're hopeless. I myself feel that it's in the interests of both sides to get a Korean peace conference. Uh, I don't think it's in the interests of the Chinese communists and the North Koreans to have a, a perpetual state of tension there, I certainly don't think it's in our interests. And I think we've got to go on very patiently seeing whether we can set up a, a political conference. I think one of the, the ironies of the present situation is that it seems to take a very long time to negotiate even the simplest matter. And here we've been spending weeks and weeks trying to decide on the composition of a conference and, and the details of time and place and so on. Well, that's the way, apparently, negotiation goes at the present time, uh, and we've got to go on seeing, trying to see whether we can't set up a political conference, which I think both sides want. Well, Mr. Lloyd, there are certain dates uh, by which uh, certain things must happen in Korea. Supposing these things don't happen in the next uh, two months, what will happen to the projected Korean Peace Conference then? Well, of course, uh, that's a hypothetical question, uh, and I would prefer not to consider the worst, but uh, at the moment they're trying to keep these explanations going. We, um, as you know, I, I think I've told you before, I went to Korea this time last year, or, or June of last year, I saw some of these prisoners and I formed my own opinion uh, as to the, their reasons for not wanting to go back to the um, North Koreans or, or to the Chinese communists. I think that many of them who were perfectly sincere in their objection to being returned to the other side, and that's why we fought so hard against forcible repatriation. Well, Mr. Lloyd, the situation in the Far East seems to be rather fluid, but in Europe it's rather more static. Uh, what do you think the prospects are of getting a European army there with German contingents? Well, I would hope that they're rather better now than they have been for some months. We believe that 
the European defense community really is a, a solution which should give grounds for a feeling of security. I don't think you can keep the Germans permanently disarmed. I don't think you can leave Germany as a vacuum in the middle of Europe, not knowing whether to go east or west. And I think the sensible solution is to have Germany integrated into a European defense community. That will be, I think, good for Germany itself and also good for the other countries of Western Europe. It will mean that the, the German contribution to defense will be within uh, a European defense community, which in itself is within NATO. And I think that should mean security for Europe and incidentally security for the Russians, because it will mean that the, the, the German contribution will be integrated with, with a Western contribution, and it's not the coalitions which make war as a rule. It's the individual states. Well, now, if that's the British view, Mr. Lloyd, why is it that Great Britain herself has not seen fit to plunge uh, full tilt into the European Army scheme? Well, we have given every support that we can to the European Army. Uh, we can't integrate our own forces in the European Army because our interests extend very far beyond Europe. Not only are we a European country, but we're also a NATO country, and also we're the center or part of a great commonwealth. And we have interests all over the world. And it's not possible, therefore, for us to go into a, a European defense community in the same way as another country of Western Europe might. But nevertheless, we have every intention of being associated as closely as we can with this European defense community. And as you know, we've got large forces on the continent of Europe at the present time, which in fact are, are a very substantial element in the uh, defense of Western Europe. And we have every intention that those forces should work in the closest collaboration with the European defense community and the European army. Mr. Minister, as you agreed before, the situation in Europe is uh, fairly stable. It seems to me, except for the joint between the NATO forces in the Balkans and Italy, and I refer specifically to Trieste. Can anything be done about that unhappy situation? Well, of course, that is, uh, as you say, uh, an unhappy situation. And uh, like so many other situations, the, the irritating thing about it is th th that the interests of both sides uh, are not dissimilar. Uh, for instance, the defense of Italy must defend, depend to a considerable extent upon having a, a strong Yugoslavia um, allied with the West in front uh, of Italy. Uh, and similarly, the defenses of Yugoslavia must depend to a considerable extent upon uh, having a, a strong Italy behind her. And therefore, strategically, uh, the interests of both those countries would seem to us to be uh, to lie along the lines of a settlement. Uh, and therefore, we hope that even out of the present controversy, there may come a reasonable settlement for both sides. And we, in fact, think that the proposition of October the 8th was a reasonable settlement for both sides. And we hope in time that it may be realized to be so. Well, Mr. Lloyd, you uh, Britishers have important interests in the Middle East. Can anything be done about stabilizing the peace in that strategic area? Yes, we, we certainly have uh, very important interests in the Middle East as has the United States. And that has been a, a source of, of constant trouble uh, since the war. One of the outstanding um, features in that trouble has been the row between Iran and Britain over the oil. Well, we hope that with this new government of Iran, with whom we are very desirous of entering into full and friendly diplomatic relations, we hope with that new government there may be prospects uh, uh, of settling that oil dispute. So far as Egypt is concerned, we've been negotiating for many months with General Naguib's government uh, to try and settle that problem. And again, that's another problem where the interests of both sides are very similar. There's this great base with all these uh, um, armaments uh, and installations there, and uh, one would think that they are an important element in the defense of the whole Middle East. And uh, we're trying to work out a reasonable arrangement between Egypt and ourselves whereby that base shall be available for the free world if any danger should come. And then the other factor in, in, in the Middle East is this unfortunate uh, situation between Israel 
and the Arab states, and that's now being considered by the Security Council, two aspects of it are, uh, and once more, we, we would hope that these countries will, will realize that their interests lie in, in preserving uh, the peace. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Selwyn Lloyd, for being with us tonight. I'm very glad to have been here. The opinions you've heard our speakers express tonight have been entirely their own. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Larry Lesser and Charles Collingwood, both from the CBS television news staff. Our distinguished guest was the Right Honorable Selwyn Lloyd, British Minister of State. Now, for the most important name on your Christmas gift list, the gift of complete acceptability is Longines, the world's most honored watch. Throughout the world, no other name on a Christmas watch means so much as Longines, the watch of highest prestige among the world's finest watches. The prestige of a Longines watch as a Christmas gift transcends price. It springs from the countless honors which Longines watches have won. For excellence and elegance, 10 World's Fair grand prizes and 28 gold medals. For accuracy, highest honors in the field of precise timing. Yes, throughout the world, no other name on a Christmas gift watch means so much as Longines, the world's most honored watch. And you may buy and proudly give a Longines watch this Christmas for as little as seventy-one fifty, made to the unique Longines standard of excellence with those qualities of greater accuracy and long life for which Longines watches are famous. Longines, the world's most honored watch, the world's most honored Christmas gift. Premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. This is Frank Knight reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem. Agency for Longines Whitnor watches. There is only one Atmos, the perpetual motion clock created by La Coultre. Atmos runs without winding, without electricity, powered only by unfailing daily variations in the temperature of the air. Atmos, product of La Coultre, division of Longines Whitnor. History repeated, and you are there Sundays on the CBS.